Hello and welcome to News Center. I'm Parikshit Lutra. It's a landmark judgment by the Supreme Court. The country's apex court has ruled that all women, whether married or not, are entitled to abort a pregnancy any time up to 24 weeks. In another hearing, the Supreme Court said that it would hear petitions against WhatsApp's privacy policy from January next year. This after, union government seeks time till the winter session of parliament to pass a data protection bill. Ashwit Kumar gets us all the latest from the court corner. With a landmark verdict coming from the Apex Court, and perhaps it's fit, it's coming on September 29th, the day which is recognized as the day of safe abortion. Uh, we're talking about uh, the right to abortion here. Uh, we're talking about uh, reproductive and bodily autonomy. That's how the Supreme Court phrased it. Uh, the concern that was here before the Apex Court was the legal anomaly called the MTP Act. Now, the MTP Act, the way it is structured, at least was structured uh, prior to this judgment, was done in a way that it specifically excluded single unmarried women from getting abortions done. Now, this was something that the Apex Court has taken objection to a bench headed by Justice Chandrachur very clearly holding that the marital status of a woman cannot be grounds for denying her or for denying refusing uh, a safe treatment for getting safe and, and legal abortions done. In fact, the Supreme Court has very clearly held uh, that all women till, week, uh, till the week 24 should have equal access in terms of abortion facilities and abortion rights. Not just that, the Apex Court also recognized instances of violence within marriages and this is perhaps the first time that through, by way of a judicial verdict, we have recognition of the concept of marital rape. Uh, the Supreme Court said that there is no denying it, uh, that this is clearly something that happens and that forced pregnancies within marriages are also eligible for abortion, uh, at least in the week 24. So this is an important landmark clarification coming, from, coming in from the Apex Court. In fact, uh, we spoke to very many stakeholders. Let's in fact uh, go across to them and listen in uh, to what they had to say. These are the basic fundamental rights which should not be, no one should be denied from these rights to in India and therefore it will be a huge success for India and it will set benchmark for all over the, all over the countries. I think this judgment goes a long way. It recognizes that an unmarried woman is equally entitled to a safe abortion as is a married woman. It also recognizes the right to abortion of a ma married woman if the pregnancy has happened out of unwanted and forced kind of a sexual encounter by the husband. So I think that's a, that's a historic uh, kind of recognition of a social reality. Well, the second key takeaway was the WhatsApp privacy policy case. This is the case where various petitions have raised the question why WhatsApp has different standards of privacy for its users in Europe versus its users here in India. WhatsApp responded by saying, look, look we have different rules to comply with in Europe. There are different laws here in India. Uh, this invited a sharp comment from the Supreme Court. Supreme Court observing that, look, this serves as an admission that WhatsApp does indeed have differential standards and that India, which is the largest market, deserves its due. Now, Centre, importantly, has clarified that they look to come out with a data protection regime as early as the winter session of the parliament and that's the deadline that the apex court has given them either come out with the data protection law in the winter session or the supreme court will go ahead and will proceed to hear and decide this whatsapp privacy policy case that's the second takeaway the third key takeaway is that india now has a new attorney general in the form of r venkata ramani uh, this was not without its fair share of drama keep in mind that the current uh, attorney general is due to retire on september 30th which is tomorrow and just uh, weeks ahead of that uh, there was an offer made by the government to mukul rahadgi former attorney general to resume his position again as the AG. He, however, refused that position and it's only after that, uh, that late last night, the announcement was made to have R. Venkata Ramani as the new Attorney General of India. Now, just a little about the jurist, about the man there, uh, about Mr. Venkata Ramani. Well, he enrolled himself as a lawyer in 1977, which is way back when. In fact, that's the year that Muraji Desai came to power with the Janta Party defeating Indira Gandhi. So that's just for context. In 97, uh, he elevated himself, uh, he was elevated as a senior advocate. Uh, he's also appeared in several key matters. The Amrapali matter, arguing extensively in the hijab ban case. So the man has extensive experience uh, stretching across over four decades. So huge amount of experience. He's expected to take charge on the 1st of October. He'll have a term of three years. In fact, uh, he also addressed the public, uh, issuing a comment. Let's in fact listen in uh, to what he had to say. Given the assistance I would be bestowed with from all my friends, I'll be in a position to discharge his responsibility. As I say, without fear or favor and without ill will and uh, to the best of my abilities. This is as good as the oath taking. But I am deeply uh, grateful to all those people who have made this possible for me. 
That was our Venkat Ramani, the new Attorney General. Let's move on now. One of the biggest casualties of the COVID pandemic, the travel and tourism industry is slowly but steadily returning to normal. And while the festive season for the last two years offered little to no cheer, the sector remains upbeat this time around. Abhimanyu Sharma spoke to top hoteliers to get a sense of the sentiment within the sector. He filed this story. Take a look. COVID-19 had dealt a body blow to the travel and tourism industry and the festive season was subdued. This year promises to be different and the industry is also hoping for the same. While the industry is hoping for a recovery in demand, it has no risk appetite for any further investments. demand has been growing uh, gradually uh, once the pandemic was over slowly slowly it's been beginning to pick up and uh, even those sectors like for example meetings and uh, incentives which were not happening are happening now right now there is no expansion plan I'll be honest with you because you know we've had a very tough uh, last two years uh, we are now wanting to stabilize ourselves first which we will we expect that by end of the festive season we should be back to, in all counts, uh, to what the normal uh, pre-COVID situation was. Not on uh, foreign <coughs> tourist arrivals, which will perhaps take a little longer, but uh, expectations are very high. A lot of capital being employed by uh, uh, HNIs, uh, institutional funding at the moment is not at the same level what we want it to be, although it's improving. People have decided to move out. They want to live for today and uh, even take shorter holidays uh, and that too multiple ones. Uh, there was a time when people used to go out, they used to say, okay, let me spend 10 days or 15 days and have a vacation. Now they go three times and which is very good. And we have asked for a few specific things. One is uh, in infrastructure status for our industry, which will actually attract more investment. And we are also looking at industry status at the state levels because tourism is actually a state subject. So when we have these people uh, giving industry status in various states, it will uh, be a good point to have industry-related benefits. So your operating costs would be less, there will be more attraction and more pull factor for investment. There will be you know, better times for, for the industry. There are a range of demands in terms of the foreign trade policy issues or taxation issues or the grant of infrastructure status to the industry, which we are in dialogue with the relevant you know, people in, within government and outside for you know, a re resolution on these matters. So this is a great opportunity for the country because the G20 meetings will be held at 55 locations throughout the country. So it gives an occasion, you know, G20 is a very important group of nations. Large part of the global GDP is there, large significant amount of the population lives there. So the meetings that will help, you know, take place, of course, will help the G20 cause as well help us project the country, you know, in a better light to in these countries. Expecting the global tourist economy to grow at twice the pace of the growth in global economy, India is picking its hopes on the G20 meetings lined up at over 55 locations across the country in 2023, while the tourism industry is seeking various benefits and has made several demands with respect to taxation and the according of infrastructure status to the tourism industry. The government wants to ensure that every delegate who returns from India returns as a tourism ambassador for the Indian tourism industry. In Delhi with video journalist Naresh, this is Abhimanyu Sharma for CNBC TV 18. All right, that was Abhimanyu Sharma doing a check of uh, the travel and tourism industry in this festive season. We're going to take a short break here on News Center, but on the other side, the government is considering sweetening incentives for the IT hardware companies under the PLI scheme in order to boost investments. A special discussion on the other side. Welcome back. You are watching News Center. The government is considering higher financial incentives for IT hardware companies under the PLI scheme in order to boost investments. The PLI scheme for IT hardware has so far seen a muted response. The government plans to increase financial outlay to around 19,000 crore rupees and double the incentive rates for the sector. 
Presently, the draft proposal has been circulated within the industry for a feedback. It's yet to go to the cabinet. Let me go across now to Aruna Sharma, former secretary at the Ministry of Electronics and IT, Pankaj Mohindru, chairman at the India Cellular and Electronics Association. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Aruna Sharma, why do you think the, the PLI scheme for IT hardware in this form did not really take off? Was it because the incentive size was too small for some of the bigger players like Apple, like Samsung, for that matter? Uh, let me put it this way. The PLI scheme was very effective when we got the uh, mobile assembly manufacturers in India. And that time, the handholding was done by giving them an advantage. Today, you have an import duty, zero duty, as per the signatory of this 19971TA-1, which allows completely built unit at zero duty to be imported. So on one hand, you have an import competition with a zero duty, and second hand is to encourage the local manufacturer. So therefore, it is very important to have a holistic thing in this policy, and that's why you did get applicants. And uh, then if you look at the qualifying numbers they have put for the investment and production, now, these qualifying numbers are very high. I think very few will qualify for this uh, whenever they are going, and therefore, there is a need to have a relook. Then, parallelly, PLI scheme has to be sort of uh, in sync with your other schemes that you are doing, like your gem portal. You know, you have come up with an amendment in the rule where uh, you are talking about, uh, you know, 200 crores uh, calculation of a local manufacturer. And that is something which the entire sector is little concerned about because then it sort of creates a problem if they are not going to get a public procurement in a very big way. And if you look at it, then uh, to be qualified as a class one focal supplier status, uh, it becomes very, very difficult for them to get because original equipment manufacturing in India contract has to be worked out to that lessons. So the idea is very good to encourage the local manufacturing, but then there is a chain of it. And there has to be like GST, you should have the credits pass on. So whatever a local manufacturer is making a parts of it or some portions of it, which slowly starts getting indigenized, then definitely that kind of a credit should be there made available to them. And it is very, very important that this okay. local content, what we are talking about, has to be worked in hmm. sync. And that is one of hmm. the reasons that your PIL scheme, along with the procurement hmm. policies, along with other policies, they all have to be synced to get a better response from the manufacturers. All right. Let me get in Pankaj Mohindru to get an industry view. Uh, Pankaj Mohindru, the government has been consulting industry bodies, also some of the global manufacturers to understand what they really want, what the PLI scheme is missing right now, what is the kind of feedback you've received from uh, the likes of Apple, Samsung, Dell, HP, for that matter? Uh, you know, we are uh, extremely happy that uh, the government is constantly reevaluating uh, policies and... You're on mute, uh, sir. Sorry. No, I'm not. Uh, I'm not on mute. Can you hear me? Okay. My apologies. Yes. Uh, uh, is the government is constantly reevaluating uh, schemes which have not taken off uh, as expected, and I think the uh, you see PLI is not about public procurement etc. PLI is about creating global scale and getting India a place in the global manufacturing ecosystem, uh, which also includes uh, the domestic uh, market, which is. Uh, quite tiny uh, as far as uh, IT hardware is concerned. We are just about 2% of the world. Now, in the $300 billion uh, aspiration target, uh, which we are determined to achieve, that cannot be done only on uh, smartphones. The other verticals have to kick in. So we have a substantial number for IT hardware by 2526, which is about 25 to $30 billion. Uh, with 25 to 30 billion dollars also we are just about 12 to 15 percent of the global market but that is what we are trying to achieve now certainly uh, there is deep concern about the rising import which is uh, reached about 8 billion dollars it's a very fast growing category 
uh, although the market size is very small in India compared to global market. So that uh, plus the fact that uh, we are not uh, wanting to have any import substitution policy here because of the fact that you know a global scale is trying to be created. So on these uh, basis, the scheme which was giving an average of 2.2% uh, did not find too much favor with the industry. And now uh, the, the revision which is uh, being discussed uh, seems to be, uh, you know, seems to be such that it will have a positive impact. And uh, we are very confident that, uh, you know, most uh, companies will, uh, uh, you know, take advantage of this and look at the targets very seriously. And I think it's still in the making, but uh, we are, uh, uh, you know, cautiously optimistic about the outcomes now. Okay, and uh, Mr. Mohindra, could you also give us a sense uh, of what are the additional components which will be added to the scheme? Right now, we know about tablets, laptops, servers, all-in-one PCs, which are covered under uh, the current PLI framework for IT hardware. What could Scheme 2.0 have in terms of additional components? It's it's in discussion at the moment, but the, uh, there is additional uh, what is being planned, the structure which is being planned, are additional uh, benefits you get on uh, deepening the value chain. Uh, so there are components, uh, sub-assemblies like PCB, PCBA, you know, battery pack, power module, uh, the mechanics, which is the chassis, uh, you know, mechanics is loosely used for smartphones. So, here, some different terminologies are used because this is a much older industry. Then the display panel, then the memory modules, the assembling of the memory modules, uh, the assembling of the solid state drive. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we have these uh, two microprocessors, Shakti and Vega, which are there now, which India has uh, been able to produce. Now, if a SOC, a system on chip, on these uh, microprocessors is uh, created, then there is a additional uh, benefit, which is envisaged. That is really deep and profound, and you know, uh, this is a this is a aspiration which is uh, very audacious. But uh, I think the way we are uh, able to make things happen, uh, this will also. Uh, happen. But of course, uh, a lot of uh, ducks need to be lined up for that, which is, uh, you know, our academic institutions, our SOC uh, uh, companies, uh, which includes uh, startups and companies which are already, uh, you know, mm -hmm. doing it. So all these things will have to be lined mm -hmm. up, the productization, and then finally, okay. what we are able to do uh, in terms of taking these products to the market. Uh, this will be, these SOCs will be all available right. to all that is there. So on one side, there is the organic okay. uh, stuff, which is the hardware, which has to be uh, put together, uh, the sub-assemblies and the right. other components which I mentioned. And then this parallel exercise of uh, right. the use of Shakti and Vega with the SOCs. This is what uh, the broad uh, okay. uh, discussions uh are. All right, those are the broad contours. Uh, Ms. Sharma, coming back to you, from what we are getting to know from the government, the current incentives range from 1 to 4%. 1 to 4%. Uh, it increases over a four-year period. And in the, in the new scheme that the government is uh, discussing right now, the incentives could be in the range of 45 to 7.5%. Uh, would this be good enough to attract some of the larger electronic manufacturers and what would be the most important piece in the puzzle, according to you? Uh, you are very the right. The in the earlier scheme are actually going down. They they come down. That's the architecture is like that. It's they don't. Four increase. to one percent. Four to one percent. It's four to one percent. No, it's four to one percent. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Mister. Four to. Yes. Wanted to mention about it that, and the idea is good. That incentive is uh, something India being a huge market. 
it is very very important that in, uh, everybody is looking at it and encouraging it with the make in india concept where we want to import replacement it is very important to make these people who are ready to invest in india and shift their uh, manufacturing from other places or their parent countries or other countries to india uh, the government procurement you know it should not be incurred, uh, sort of ignored because if you if i take the example of laptop 50% is now important and it may go to 10000 crores of all you know uh, in coming days so in the sense if it is to be cross checked every piece of the market should be made attractive to these people who are investing in india whether it is the public sector procurement whether it's a market sales that is happening and therefore imports uh, uh, substitution incentive is to be given in policy money is not the main driver as far as the hardware industry is concerned and the subsidy part of it what is more important is a reverse engineering from the market preference let me give you an example what we did in steel we said the preference will be given to those who make in india and that did the trick when we started giving the preference they don't need so much of uh, these kind of an incentive initially money incentive is fine to give it a push it is a market which sits on the driving seat and that okay. is where this policy should focus upon they doing a reverse engineering that from the market of creating a market by allowing them as a preference uh, preference thing whether it's a uh, your gem platform procurement whether it's a market procurement allowing them and import substitution policy assistance or facilitation all this when it sinks then definitely it is going to trigger on people are interested people will apply to it and the whole chain of uh, upstream and downstream will also start getting shifted to india so that is going to make a huge difference plus there is a talk now going about uh, of uh, sort of bringing similar to pli scheme for the semiconductors and that is also going to trigger it off when we are talking of the semiconductors that you have to get the latest of the technology it can't be outdated technology because it's a fast moving technology of the hardware so the mistake which we did in the previous scheme and i will agree to that that it's not just assembly we want actual manufacturing to happen in india and that is the trigger point of the pli that is the intention of pli that should be the focus of the pli all right, we've run out of time, but thank you very much, Ms. Sharma and Ms. Pankaj Mohindru for uh, joining us. Uh, we believe that uh, the government would very soon like to take this to the cabinet for approval, PLI 2.0 for uh, the IT hardware industry. Thank you very much for joining us on this edition of News Center. News continues on CNBC TV 18.